What's my justification for being here? Well, I've worked for 45 years, graduated in 1970, three years in weave, final year in print, why not? Went to the circular knit industry simply because it was central London, walls were brown, desks were white. Went then, that was Marks and Spencer supplier, baptism of fire, Orthodox Jewish company, oh my. From sunny little quiet Scotland, oh, that was a real awakening. I learned hugely about organisation. I had to look up my notes on circular knitting. I hadn't done it at uni except in a class. Keep your notes. I then progressed as a fashion advisor for a fibre company which took me throughout Europe. Came back because somebody offered me a sports car to go and do fashion advising for their company. Why not? Husband then said, time to breed, let's go to Scotland. He was offered a job. I went, uh, no, don't think so. Gave up the sports car, followed him eventually. Thought, what am I going to do? One of my customers said, become our fabric uh, advisor. Okay, all right, I'll do that. Went to the university, said, Harriet Watt said, oh, I, I need a job. Okay, you can do weaving. I said, no, I don't think so. I've been doing knitting up till now. I'll do knitting. Okay, things have changed. I don't have a PhD. I donned a gown by mistake one day, and somebody said, oh, what's your PhD? And I said, oh, in my business, if you've done a PhD, it means you can't get a job. Now, I'm sorry for all you PhD people out here, but actually, that's how it was in my career. Um, so anyway, taught part-time. Consultancy business grew, did colour for a cashmere spinner. Cashmere spinner wanted their customers have knitwear designed. I said, me, oh, I can do that. Went back to the notes. In the meantime, I'd learned a bit more about knitwear. Uh, did, so basically then started my own consultancy business, which I've been doing throughout two children. I ignored, the, the children survive the ignoring. Never feel the guilt. Because they play, they get more presents. That's another, I mean, really they do. And, you know, please don't take the guilt with you because children are very good at turning that up on, on you. So children um, worked, did any job that took me to another bit of information. Worked for DuPont, the global fibre company, worked for Indian spinners, been to the Himalayas, done all sorts of good and bad things. Um, worked for a lot for IWS, for um, Walmart company, for Campaign for Wool. Still working, just been to Australia, China, Hong Kong, New York, London, Paris, which at our age, Hamish and I, he's a weaver, it's fantastic, you know, to be A, to be asked, and B, to still be able to do it. And we do it because we love it. And the reason we love it is because this business is fantastic. And so I'm going to quickly, this is going to hopefully draw together what you've seen, because you haven't all been to the same place. And these are the, 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 the chances. This is the business. And you've seen some, you've heard some of the speakers who are in this business. And these are the different opportunities where you, if you think of yourselves as designers first, get back to your notes to acquire the knowledge or ask the questions you can do. It starts with fibres and it's a very ignored, without the fibres we ain't got anything. Lots of people think that garment design, which gets all the attention, and I deliberately am not calling it fashion because we're all in the fashion business, Garment design is the be-all and the end-all because that's the thing that consumers understand. But actually, they're going nowhere unless they're extruded something or other or metal without fibres. And they exist in all these different forms. And they end there or they end there. And it's the first industry. And you can work in that industry. I've had many a successful career move working, a consultancy working for fibre companies. The fibres, as we know, come from a variety of different sources. And I think and not enough, um, Terrell was talking about sustainability. We're going to have to revisit a lot of these because of the sustainability, because of the move to eco, because big brands are signing up to you know, uh, zero discharge, hazardous chemicals, reach, all this sort of thing. We're going to have to look at this very seriously. It needs design people to lead it simply because you're going to be able to anticipate what might happen. And that's what you're training for. You're training to observe and record and anticipate and then put that into some sort of end purpose. They come fun fundamentally from natural starting points, which might be animal, vegetable, insect or mineral, and then two different sorts of polymers. Natural po polymers that are found naturally or synthetic polymers. I don't know which is the best route. I have to tell you, I've given lectures on it. I am still not convinced. There isn't one route to the bestness for the world. But basically, whatever you do, 
Synthetic polymers you can extrude and you can chop them up and you can make them into staple, which is the short length, and you then can process them. Natural polymers, the same, you can make them into a gloop, so trees and um, little crabs and seaweeds and all these things can be made into fibres and then you can extrude them, chop them up, make them into um, textiles. Or you can find them from natural sources, but they've all got to be processed. And that is, you probably saw some of it today. I don't know if you um, went into anybody who had their own spinning, but yarn is, again, really another industry. Have any of you done any yarn design? Because if you get the chance, put your hands up. It's, they're crying out for yarn designers because people don't have the kit at universities anymore. So yarn is a great opportunity because, you know, is it bouclé? Is it smooth? Is it silky? What is it? That means you've got to go back to the fibre and say, well, if it's silky, I don't want it to be a coarse, count, a coarse micron of wool. It's got to be either fine merino or it's got to be silk or whatever, or viscose. And so this industry is massive. Synthetic fibres come in this little form. They're, they're generally oil-based. They come in little pellets. They're put into a machine. They're melted down and they're extruded. And you can extrude them in all sorts of different ways. And the way in which you extrude them determines their qualities. So if you want warmth in them, you create a hole. If you want to put your letters in, your, your initials in for security, you know, there's an awful lot of copy, copying goes on in the world, copyright, et cetera, et cetera. Extrude it with the word Nike in it or Adidas or whatever. You can then just simply take a sample and you know that you've not been knocked off. So that's becoming more and more important. You can design a totally synthetic fiber to have any of the properties that you want. And basically, they're all trying to mimic natural fibers. To make them lustrous, they have very sort of long and convoluted um, circumferences so that they actually reflect light more. Um, it, it's a fascinating science. And the way in which you produce them determines how they'll behave. But on the other hand, if you go into the wool industry, our dear old sheep, our dear old yaks and cashmere goats, etc., all give us fibre. And the fibre, when it comes off, is like that, is mucky, because they don't sit around in nice clothes in the fields, obviously. They're not very clean and tidy sheep. And you have to get it to that. And that is a pretty ghastly process, actually. But that's what gives you lanolin. So all of us who are putting on creams and makeup, that's what it comes out of. It's um, a naturally occurring... Uh, it is cleaned out of these ghastlinesses, but fundamentally, this is the start of the processing of natural fibres. So after it's cleaned, you've got all this mass, in this instance, wool. How do you get it to that thing that you can weave or knit um, and further process? And that process is called carding, and it's an aligning process. It's fairly brutal. A carding set is actually a series of metal rollers. You do not want to get caught between them because it's a fairly nasty outcome. And the, the fibres follow a route through this machine getting more and more aligned. There are several different routes to it. The two main ones that you need to hold in your brain are woolen and worsted. The woolen industry is the hairy, fluffy industry, which is shorter staple. The worsted is the longer staple and makes silkier, smooth yarns and therefore fabrics. And you wouldn't believe the number of people who 20 years on in the industry don't know the difference between woolen and worsted. Please hold that in your brains if you hold nothing else. Because frankly, you look, like, you look foolish if you don't understand the difference because you can't then decide which fabrics you want to use or which yarns you want to use. That's a woolen yarn, that's a worsted yarn. One's much hairier, it's designed to be loftier, to put bulk into it, it's a shorter process. The worsted processing route is sleeker and designed to produce this luster. Generally speaking, this is a process without colour. But if you want to produce a melange or a mixture yarn, you've got to dye that fibre. That's a big commitment at the start of the chain, so you've got to be jolly accurate. So please, if you're going to buy melange yarn, don't go six months down the line and then turn around and say to the spinner, look, could you add a bit more blue? Because they'll just look at you. And they'll, they'll say a lot of bad things behind your back. You don't understand. You're committing to dying, in this instance, four blues and a black, you know, 
multicolours and a brown, you're processing it from dyed fibre. It's a big financial commitment for a company. But through the carding process, the outcome is a fibre web, which gradually becomes a sliver or a roving, depending on whether you're the woolen or the worsted process. It's getting more and more aligned. And at the moment, it's like a long length of cotton wool. And it's the same in the cotton spinning industry. It's, it's got no coherence. So you're putting it through a factory until you get it to the spinning system, which is drafting it, pulling it out, making it thinner and thinner and thinner, and eventually adding twist. Because if you haven't got twist in it, it's very difficult to process. The higher the twist, the more suitable for the weaving industry, the less for the knitwear industry. And of course, hand knitters use a lot of unspun rovings to make great big chunky things, or people needle punch them, or whatever. But the mule spinning is primarily for the woolen system. The worsted spinning system use ring spinning and combinations of both. You don't need to get hooked up in that detail as designers, but it's great to know, because you're then not bamboozled by vocabulary. So the salient issue on twist, you get two sorts of twist, S for Sheila Mary, named after moi, not. Z is the other way, and it's very self-obvious. Just if, if you don't have S and Z balanced, you end up with snarled yarns and twisted T-shirts. Everybody's got a T-shirt that the side seam just moves, you know, round to the front. You think, oh, I've just pressed it badly. Not. It's the twist that's wrong. And fundamentally, you've got to balance S against, the S against Z, because if you don't, you end up with all this kind of nasty going on. It's a vital piece of your armory as designers. You might want the twist tighter, you might want the twist slacker. That's all within your control, and you could ask a spinner to do so. It will affect the handle massively. And without something feeling good or being fit for purpose, however clever you are as a designer, it's doomed. <laughs> Yarn often then, to keep flexibility, the Zaras of this world keep to the very last minute. Um, most people will, a lot of people work in dyed yarn, it's a better handle, but it's a bigger commitment because it comes in earlier. So a lot of it's dyed in yarn form. However, if you want to produce mélange from the French mixture, which is what we saw at the beginning, you have to commit to dyeing the fibre, which is the, why mélange yarns are more expensive because you hold dyed fibre, you then mix it accordingly. These carding sets are the width of this room. You have to clean it because you want to get rid of the brown before you process the blue. So fundamentally, it's a long, expensive process. Another way of getting this mixture effect is to twist and make a marl yarn. So that is basically one end of dyed colour one with colour two or colour three or colour four. Difference between a marl and a mélange. The best greys are mélange greys. And you'll come across them, you know, the heather mixtures, call them what you like, but known in the trade as mélange. Fancy yarn design. I mean, there's an enormous opportunity here for all of you. Not all at once, but, you know, for some of you, think about going, if you get the chance, and the fancy yarn industry is massive. Not necessarily here, sadly, anymore, but in Asia, they produce anything. They put anything together. And these are all the sort of profiles. But you can invent, those are all the... The, the sort of understood chenille, boucle, knop, snarls, but you know, you can make your own. And it changes the character of the fabric, totally. And this trade has its own exhibitions. They need designers to showcase their products. You've been to Pitti, you've been to maybe Spin Expo. Basically, all these spinners, which there are hundreds, what, it's very hard just to sell a piece of yarn. So they need to have it woven, they need to have it knitted. That's a chance for you guys to come in and say, I'll showcase your product, I'll do you a statement twice a year to show at these shows. They need their stands designed. They need somebody to design their knitwear, to weave their scarves, to showcase their product, to make shoes, do whatever. Chance. Expo Phil in Paris, Spin Expo in Shanghai or New York. I mean, that's what lots of people do for a living. I did it for a living for seven, well, for part of a living for seven years. This is another industry. Now, you, you, you heard from Beryl yesterday. She is one of the, you know, the big British color ex global colour experts. That's partly what she does for a, a living. It's a big industry, but it doesn't just apply to textiles. You know, one of, I worked with a girl who suddenly got in touch with Tupperware, and she spent, she was a tech, she still is in the textile business, and she does all the colours for Tupperware. You know, cars, wallpaper, paint, chairs. Colour predictions are terribly important. And everybody says, oh, I want to work in trends. 
You will be working in trend. You cannot avoid it if you go into this business because we work in a seasonal business. You have to anticipate what's going to happen 18 months ahead. Dying fibre, that happens. That's a big commitment. The dyeing industry, dyeing for melange, we've covered. Hank Dyeing produces the best handle. Oh, a bit too quick. Woven fabric, that's how Zara do it, quick turnaround. They hold what we call greyish fabric, and then, you know, they suddenly sell lots of blue. Oh, let's dye up more blue. Greyish coming from the French grey, meaning grey fabric, undyed fabric. We dye it up, and that's generally speaking for the knitting or the, or the woven trade. Uh, garment dyeing, of course, means that it's, you know, even quicker, that you're getting... Um, quicker, closer to the point of sale, so you're able to, you know, if suddenly let lime cells, or my favourite, neon cells, then, you know, quickly you can dye that up. But it doesn't operate very well um, for the sort of luxury end of the trade because it's a pretty harsh process. That said, if you understand it, uh, the Woolmark have done a lot of work on garment dyeing of knitwear. Now, they took a process and turned it on its head. And that was because they understood the process and then they, they wanted to get vintage effects. They've got their merino sweaters, all with this lovely, because of the dye uptake, all sort of vintage effects. It's about understanding how to use technology to what the market wants. So we're now into the four, five, and six industries, which is the fabric. It's weaving, warp knitting, and weft knitting. I'm sure here, this room is filled with people who understand about warp preparation. Now, I, I live with a weaver, and he says that it's a much slower process because you've got to weave, and you've got to draft, and you've got to draw it, and all this kind of stuff. And knitting's an easy business. So we have a lot of our marital life discussing the pros and cons of this situation. I think he's wrong, of course. But um, you do have preparatory processes, whether you're in the hand-weaving industry or the power-weaving industry, but the outcome is the same as in the jacquard industry. The fabric knitting industry was the warp knitting industry where again you prepare a beam, you produce fabric very quickly, very cheaply, but it's a long beam, it only works in large scales, so that's how you get your economies. The warp knitting industry also includes this uh, business for activewear garments which is growing and is massively looking for uh, designers. Circular industry, the t-shirt business, the jersey business. I cut my teeth in it, and I'm like Cheryl. I did um, jacquards on point paper. I was so bad at it, they took me off it. Oh, dreadful, dreadful, hated it. But I learned an awful lot. It's got its own fabric uh, trade exhibitions. Again, they still need samples. For those of you that have been to PV, they need you to come and help. Finishing, those of, these are the processes you would see at Johnson's. This is a miss underloved part of the business. It changes the face of fabrics. Dyeing obviously is one, but the finishing of fabrics, whether it's teaseling or whatever they're doing, completely offers you fantastic opportunities. Don't, un you must love these ladies. They mend meters and meters of fabrics who sit there and darn in when something, I mean, it's not steel we're weaving. Well, maybe Pennine are, but it's, you know, basically it's things that break. And, you know, in order to preserve the fabric, they'll darn in the design. They all wear very powerful glasses, and they're very skilled, and they're a dying breed. You've got it, so we're trying to train more furiously. But these are all the things that you can do for additional finishes. And you would see some of them at Hainsworth's, where they, you know, they do a lot of felting and brushing, cropping, milling, transform the fabric quality, but it's got to be designed with that in mind. Laser cutting, you've got to design it. All the things you've got to take account of if you're going to change the character through finishing. And it's not necessarily all machine finishing. Why not cover it in gold leaf? There's a market for that sort of thing. So don't think just because I'm talking about the large scale industry that the other end of it isn't applicable to you. If you can find somebody to pay a thousand pounds a meter for your fabric and you do it all by hand, terrific. That's still business. And the business needs you at the top end as much as it needs you at the bottom end. Screen printing, you understand about, those of you that are in it. The Okay, please. 
There we go. You know it's either hand, it's either rotary, it's either um, screen. It can be a large or small process, it can be digital. Let's not get worried about, let's understand what the characteristics are and decide how we're going to use them before we get too kind of, oh, digital doesn't do. It does do, it depends what you're doing it for. Fabric pleating, that transforms fabrics. Fabric pleating and printing, or printing then pleating, transforms fabrics. You can pleat and print almost anything. It depends how permanent you want it to be. And that, you know, embroidery. Imagine combinations of all of these. Microencapsulation, a technology you possibly don't know about. <gasps> I'm speaking very fast, I've only got two minutes. Um, Microencaps, uh, that's adding something to a finished fabric which is literally lit millions of tiny little balls filled with something. It can be green, it, 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 it's not a harmful process. You put it onto your fabric, it's a topical application. When you touch it, you break these little capsules and it releases what's ever inside. So that could be aloe vera, it could be vitamin E, it could be a drug, a good drug. It could be um, a smell, you know. It, it, you know, anthrop uh, Anthropology and what's her name, um, Abercrombie and Fitch, spray their clothes. So you walk in and you think, ooh, this is lovely. You know, because the science of smell is fantastic. Why bother doing that? Why not just, when is, you know, we, we all wash our clothes in conditioner, same thing. But you can topically apply all sorts of things so it can be protective, it can be water stain repellent. And again, it's understanding what your customer will want. You can Devore print, you can madras lace, that's a lovely technique. If you've never seen madras lace, go to Morton Young and Borland website. They, they're unique and the only, the only people in this country who produce it. It's beautiful, Morton Young and Borland, MYB. You can find out there. Um, so garment industry, concept, garment design, twill making, garment specification, tech pack. You can't go anywhere nowadays without being technical. You've got to send tech packs across the world, grab your technology while you can. These are all the processes which you do understand, but we forget how many there are before we get to this business. And if you think about it, it's, these are all separate industries and they have fairs, worldwide locations, for which they need designers, they have specific exhibitions. Salt Lake City holds the biggest active wear fair in the world. Utah, for heaven's sake, great place to go, but it's there because that's where all the active wear people are. I, I had years, I never did active wear at uni, but you know, working in that industry, it's great. Then there's the knitwear industry, which is a completely specific and different industry, offering you all these different routes to producing garments. Hand knitting is still an option, it's still used, power machines. The knitwear make is a very complicated process if you go through the luxury knitwear make and understanding what's relevant for your market. I did weaving for heaven's sake and now what do I do? Make a living on knitwear side of things. It's about saying, I can do that, I will do that. So interiors, the process is exactly the same, but it's another industry and they have their own trade exhibitions. And then never forget, you're going nowhere unless you sell it. It's a pointless exercise unless you're a fine artist. So spend this year doing the stuff for you because at the end of the day, unless you're very lucky with the lottery, you've got to make some money. And that is fact. But it's still good because you know, there's all these options now. That's the traditional retail, the oldest retailer in the uh, uh, department store in the world. I love this pop-up business. I think that's fascinating, the way big companies are seeing themselves on an individual basis. The new retail mix where they're mixing interiors and plants and clothes and just everything that is in lifestyle. Um, you know, the new architectural places. I love Heather Wick's work. The, I haven't seen Victoria Beckham's new, but I trust all you Londoners have braved the door and gone in. You know, she needs you as customers, so don't be put off by the fact that in you know Victoria's store you've got to stand there and be let in. Just say yes, you want to look. Uh, we know about the retail. Don't be disparaging of them. You'll learn a heck of a lot. Don't be disparaging of anybody because I know there's a lot of talk on television and programs about people selling stuff at this price. Believe me, that's rife. Other people just have very high overheads. Mail order specific. We know, all know about online shopping, and, but it's changing. 10 years ago, this didn't exist. 
And this didn't exist. So you have an access for your own small business opportunity. You can sell your stuff direct across the world. That didn't happen before. But there you go. I reckon there are 11 industries. That's a hell of a lot more. That's a heck of a lot more than you thought you had to do. So I wish you good luck. We've got to keep to an incredibly tight schedule. I'm sorry it was such a rush, but at least you weren't asleep. So.